King Arthur, puller of sword from stone, king of England, creator of the round table. It's a story that's been told and retold for centuries, and it's being retold once again with King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. If you've seen one version of King Arthur's story, then you've kind of seen them all, right? Well, not really. Okay, fine, here's the thing. There is no real story of King Arthur. I don't just mean because, as far as anyone can guess, Arthur was never a real person, sorry. I mean because no one knows exactly where and when that story began. Most of what we know of King Arthur and his knights comes from a series of collections of medieval literature dating from about the 12th century, but Arthur appears in work dating back even farther. By the time folks got around to writing it all down, Arthur was already an ancient hero having lived in the 5th and 6th centuries. Because of oral traditions at the time, there is historically no one version of Arthur, no single piece of literature that is canon, so to speak, which may be why the story itself has survived so long and been adapted so easily. That being said, there is one collection of Arthur myths that seems to be the starting point for a lot of what we've come to accept as the true story of Arthur. In 1138, back when I was just a child, a man named Geoffrey of Monmouth put together his masterpiece, the not at all imposingly titled History of the Kings of Britain. In Geoffrey's version, Arthur was a fierce warrior king, the son of Uther Pendragon, cool name, and himself the King of Britain, and the wife of one of Uther's enemies. After his father's death, Arthur ascends to the throne and fights a series of 12 battles to protect Britain from the invasion of the Saxons. Once his kingdom is safe, Arthur turns his attention to expanding his empire, conquering Ireland, sorry to my great-grandparents, and Iceland, before eventually turning his efforts toward the Roman Empire. Good luck, man. You'd think taking the Romans on on their own turf would be what led Arthur to his death, but it turns out that before he could even properly fight them, he gets word that his nephew, Mordred, another cool name, has decided to steal Arthur's wife, Guinevere, and claim the throne for himself. Are you guys taking notes? Stay with us, okay? Because we're only a quarter of the way done. So, naturally, Arthur returns home and kills Mordred, but not before suffering a mortal wound himself. The king is taken to the ancient magical city of Avalon to be healed and is never seen again. Most of the stories of Arthur and his knights that we've become familiar with have been based on this version of events. After Geoffrey published his seminal work, it became extremely popular. By medieval standards, it was a bestseller. I mean, Gutenberg was busy. It led to hundreds of printed copies translated into various languages. Of course, like all popular media, that's when the adaptation started with other romantic writers taking up the story of Arthur to add even more mystery and magic, and yes, plenty of romance to the story. <laughs> What's interesting, though, is that most of these new tales didn't so much alter Arthur's story as much as they built on the stories for many of the other characters in Arthur's life, choosing instead to focus on people like Lancelot, Guinevere, Gawain, Galahad, Percival, and others. Arthur becomes mostly a figurehead, the wise ruler of Camelot, rather than the terrifying warrior and conqueror. Camelot and the Knights of the Round Table became a sandbox that other writers could play in, allowing them to realize the dream of fan fiction writers. Their creations became canon. It's here that we get stories like The Sword in the Stone and Excalibur, they were not the same thing, FYI, Lancelot's relationship with Guinevere, kind of the Angelina of his time, and the quest for the Holy Grail. The first attempt to marry both Geoffrey's historical telling of Arthur and the romantic stories that followed was in a series of five novels written in 13th century France. But it would be a man by the name of Thomas Mallory in the 15th century to finally create a single volume collection of the tales of Arthur and his knights when he wrote Le Meurs d'Arthur. <laughs> Almost every future adaptation of the story comes directly from this version including the ones we're still making for the big and small screens. After Mallory, people stopped caring so much about Arthur and his knights, sorry Arthur, until the 19th century, when Gothic and Romantic writing became popular and authors and poets sparked a renewed interest in the character and the time period. The poet, Alfred Lord Tennyson, was pretty much the Mallory of the Victorian era. He took it upon himself to create a brand new, updated version of Arthur's myths. Tennyson is basically the reason we romanticize Arthur as a tragic leader, since he created a version of Arthur who was the epitome of manhood and valor, but who failed to create a perfect utopia in Camelot, 
a utopia that we continue to strive for today. Make Camelot great again! Tennyson's work was hugely popular, selling thousands of copies, and from there, the floodgates opened. Dozens of other writers jumped onto the Arthur bandwagon, including folks like a little-known author named Mark Twain, who wrote his novel A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court in 1889. Which brings us up to the almost present, the 20th century, and the beginning of a seemingly never-ending series of adaptations for Arthur's myth for film and television. Twain's novel was adapted into the 1949 film starring Bing Crosby. Disney got into the game in 1963 with their animated film, The Sword and the Stone, which told the story of a very young Arthur learning all about magic and his royal heritage from Merlin, who we haven't talked about yet, before ascending to the throne himself. And we have no one but Walt Disney to thank for Mad Madam Mim, and for that, we give eternal praise. Probably the most popular screen adaptations are also Broadway shows. The 1967 film Camelot starred a young Richard Harris and was adapted from a wildly successful Broadway show from seven years earlier. Eight years later, the British comedy group Monty Python put their own spin on the story in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which was itself adapted as a possibly even more ridiculous musical, Spamalot, 30 years later. Clay Aiken's greatest work. And they just keep coming. From 2004's King Arthur, starring Clive Owen and Keira Knightley, to the popular series Merlin, or the less popular star series Camelot, every version tries to put their own spin on the classic tale. 2004's King Arthur attempts to pull the romantic story back to its historical roots, and it makes Guinevere a badass. I love that. Marion Zimmer Bradley's 1982 novel and the TV adaptation in 2001 focused much more on the female characters of Arthur's myths while shows like Stargate SG-1, Once Upon a Time, DC's Legends of Tomorrow, and The Librarians have adapted the characters to fit their own universes. This year, there are two brand new additions to the Arthur canon. Sons of Anarchy's Charlie Hunnam will be taking on the age-old character in King Arthur, Legends of the Sword, which follows a young Arthur raised in the streets as he fights his way back to the throne. Yeah, get there. Meanwhile, in an adaptation that will probably always sound strange, Transformers will put an Autobot spin on the legend with Transformers The Last Night. I mean, who's asking for this? I don't know. Elements of the Arthurian myth continue to pop up throughout society as the story is told and retold and adapted and changed to fit whatever is most important to the culture doing the adapting. And it's probably fair to say the characters aren't going anywhere anytime soon. So what's your favorite version of King Arthur? Let us know in the comments and make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more.